Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save in 2024. Wireless plans are just $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. To get this new customer offer, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special video here on the channel. It's one of the very rare times I think I've actually done this. I was originally going to do a streaming Charts with Dan episode this morning, but as you may have heard on Charts with Dan earlier this week, the Mint Mobile hotline, which is something that we've been doing for these first couple months of the year, will be ending this week. This is the last week that the sponsorship is going to be here on the channel, and I was looking through and trying to find the questions I wanted to answer, and I realized that I had a lot of really good questions that I just hadn't gotten to. So before we end the Mint Mobile hotline, I decided instead of doing streaming charts, don't worry, I'll probably do that this upcoming week. I wanted to just do a viewer question episode because there were a lot of great ones and some even involving the Oscars, which are happening today that I wanted to get to. So without further ado, let's get to our first question, which comes to us from Virginia. Hi, Dan. This is Court from Virginia. Uh, I'm a longtime lover of watching the Oscars. Uh, whenever I get people together, though, the only activity we really do is fill out an Oscars ballot. So as someone else who watches the Oscars, do you have any tips for activities that groups of friends can do while they watch the Oscars to make the night more fun? Thanks for that question, Court. And yeah, one of the great things about the Oscars is watching it with your friends and family and whoever else wants to watch the show. The Oscar pool, always dependable, always a good activity. But you're right, it is pretty much just scratching off names or circling things. A lot of times when I'm with a big group of people, we'll take side bets. Like, okay, who will be the first person to cry? What's the over under on crying? Who's going to be the first person to thank their agent? Is this person going to try to wander off the stage the wrong way? Things like that. The award show stuff. You could either do that just as a game to see who can spot it. You could put together a bingo card if you have time before your Oscar party this year or perhaps your Oscar party next year. But it just kind of makes the whole evening engaging. Plus, I'm sort of trained from all those days at Screen Junkies when we would stay up and write our recap right after the show to look for things like weird reaction shots or just little tiny moments that are fun to point out. So it's always great to kind of look at the background or look at the cutaways because there's always a little bit of gold there. Our next question is also about the Academy Awards, and it comes from our great neighbor in the north, Canada. Hi, Dan. This is James from Canada. My question is, do you think it's time the Academy should consider having a male and female Best Directors? It would certainly help with the controversy where often there's 10 pictures nominated for Best uh, Academy Award, but only five directors. Also, there's a lot more female directors now, thankfully, getting to make more movies. So I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, James. That's a great question, and it's something that a lot of people have been bringing up. And personally, when I think about the Oscars, no, I don't think that there should be two categories, one for male directors and one for female directors. Now, when you look at the acting categories, they are gendered. And the question around the gendering of those categories, particularly as it relates to non-binary actors, is a difficult one. It's not one that I can really tackle here. I think it's going to take some thoughtful discussion. But as it stands, I do support still separating the acting categories because I think that there's something about performance and character where you can incorporate the gender of that character into your performance, whether you're subverting gender norms, whether it's a commentary on that. I think that there is something about gender in those roles roles that makes those separations make sense to me. And I also don't think that there is any distinction made as far as which one is more important between best actor and best actress or best supporting actor and best supporting actress. I think those two awards are held on the same level. Whereas I think a lot of people would not hold best male director and best female director on the same level. And it's because largely directors have not been seen as equitable between genders. That is absolutely not fair. It's a completely backward way of thinking, but it's the reality of the matter. If the directors were separated by gender, then there would be a lot of people who would see the male director as the real prize and the female director as the backup prize. And I hate that thinking. I don't think that we should open the door to that kind of thinking. What we should open the door to is for the Academy to continue its membership goals and the film industry overall should continue to open the doors to women who are directing movies to make sure that their stories are told and get the opportunity to be told just as often as every other story. And then hopefully we won't have to have this conversation about dividing best director between men and women because we'll get to a point where it doesn't seem like there's some sort of a ceiling, a glass ceiling, if you will, where only 
only one or two female directors can be nominated every year. Maybe one year we'll get four directed and one man directed, and there's not really that conversation. So instead of splitting the categories to address the problem, I would much rather the academy and the industry do the much harder work of actually addressing the underlying problem behind what's going on. Our next call comes from somewhere in the United States from a mystery caller, but I'm guessing it's somewhere in the South. Hey, Dan, I've been a long time viewer and fan ever since your screen junkie days, but I just came across a rumor of an American Psycho remake at Lionsgate. I don't know how true that is, but from your point of view, is it easier for a studio to get a remake funded knowing it's likely going to result in horrible quality and horrible reviews compared to an original movie and story. Thanks for keeping me going to the movies after five kids, Dan. Keep doing what you're doing. That's a great question, and the answer, I think, is absolutely yes. A studio will nine times out of ten take the remake over the original film because a remake is easier to sell, it's easier to get financing, it's easier a lot of times to get actors to be in them, and it's easier to get an audience to go see, even though they probably know, hey, this may not be as critically acclaimed as this really great idea from an indie filmmaker. That's still a gamble, and studios are very risk-averse. We'll talk about this at the end of the show. A lot of studio executives would rather take the safe for bet, which will probably protect their job, than to take the gamble, which if it goes wrong, may cost them their job. Is that a stupid way of looking at it? Absolutely it is, and I think that a lot of studios are passing on great original ideas because a lot of the executives just don't have the guts to take those risks. But they are also facing reality, because let's be honest here, if Jake Gyllenhaal was in an upcoming movie that had an original title, an original-ish concept about a guy who was a bouncer in a bar, would we be talking about it in the same way that we're talking about the same concept, but with the name Roadhouse attached? People are going to be interested in a remake because they want to see whether it's good or bad, whether it can top the original. And most of the time, it doesn't, but that interest is already locked in. So studios are also catering somewhat to human nature. It's been shown time and time again, audiences will also show up in bigger numbers for things that they know rather than things that they don't know. Is that fair? No, it's not fair, but I think that some of it is studios being risk averse and some of it is studios just acknowledging the reality of what audiences will see. I think the best studios are the ones that are able to take those original ideas, figure out how to sell it to an audience and still get them to show up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Hey Dan, this is Trey from Birmingham, Alabama. I've been listening to you for a long time, even back in the early Screen Junkie days. And I know you made your transition from being on Screen Junkies to having your own YouTube channel right before or right around the time of the pandemic. Um, so with that timing, I was just curious as to how you coped with the pandemic and starting a YouTube channel right around that time. And what did you learn from that challenge? Anyway, thanks for considering answering my question. Have a good day. Thanks for that question, Trey. And as we get a little bit more distance from when I start the channel, it'll be four years in April, I can really start evaluating what that whole process was like in my head because the day that I was supposed to go into the office and tell everybody that I worked with that I was leaving to start my own channel was the day they closed the office down, literally. Instead of getting everybody together and getting to tell everybody what was going on face-to-face, -face, I just had to call everyone individually and tell people like, 10 times in a row that I was leaving. It wasn't exactly the process that I'd had in mind. And there are some people that I worked with for years, people like Billy and Roth, who you probably saw on Phantom Entertainment and Screen Junkies News, who the last time I saw them in person was whatever day I left work back in 2020, not knowing that we would never come back to the office or that I would never come back to the office again. And even when the channel first started, I remember sort of strategizing the start of all my movies and when I would start doing that show and thinking, okay, well, let's launch the show in May connecting with Black Widow because it's March now. There's no way this is still going to be going on in May. And yet it was a year and a half of just largely improvisation because 
it was almost two years before movies were really back. And so the first year and a half, two years of this channel was literally just, okay, how do I just make something, make something to help the channel grow, make something to make sure that I'm getting some sort of revenue that I could actually make a living doing this. I don't think it would have been easy without a pandemic, but it was certainly a lot harder with a pandemic. The one thing that I think it helped me to learn is improvisation and experimentation. I did some pretty weird stuff. If you go back to 2020, especially, like there were things I did on this channel that were wackadoo and not all of it worked, but it was born out of necessity. It was really just me saying like, okay, I've got to come up with something to do here. And I think what it helped to do was sort of vanquish this fear of experimentation. If the pandemic hadn't happened and I just jumped into movie reviews and charts only right away, who knows if I would have tried some of that weirder stuff or if I would have been a little bit more reticent to do something new. Not everything I do on the channel today works, but I think I'm a little less scared to try it because I had to try it when I was first starting out. Um, so looking back on it, I will say that it was definitely incredibly stressful. I mean, you add a cross country move into that whole process as well. And it really felt like everything just got completely uprooted for me in a matter of months, a lot of it for the better. I'm so happy that I started the channel that I have the freedom to try different things and experiment. Uh, but it was not what I had in mind because I made the decision to leave long before it was even a possibility that there would be a year, two year plus long pandemic. And, um, unexpected, I guess, would be the word I'd use to describe it. Our next question comes from Mike in New Jersey. Hey, Dan, this is Mike from New Jersey. Uh, my question is about Rotten Tomatoes and your thoughts on the website as a whole. Do you think it has done a good thing for film criticism and discourse as a whole, or do you think it's uh, taken away from some of the nuance? Also, what was the process like for you to become a tomato meter approved critic? Did you have to submit an application? Were you like, or were you just automatically put on the list? Thanks. Thanks for those questions, Mike. And to answer your second question first, I got lucky in that I was with an established outlet and that there were people I worked with like Roth who was very entrenched in the critical community who had that sort of trust. I think it put me on Rotten Tomatoes radar a little bit earlier and they gave me that certified critic tag, which means that my reviews carry over to any outlet, which also meant that when I started this channel, I could still post on Rotten Tomatoes. I didn't have to go back and sort of prove that this was an outlet worthy of being listed on the website. So that was really just the luck of being with Screen Junkies when I first got on the site. I know that a lot of people didn't have that same luck, and, and I do understand that that is a very privileged thing that I was able to do that, and I appreciate that. To answer the question about the Rotten Tomatoes site overall, I think it's a mixed blessing. First of all, I think that Rotten Tomatoes really has put a spotlight on film criticism, certainly unlike anything that I can remember. Siskel and Ebert was really all most people knew of film critics when I was growing up, and then maybe the person who wrote the reviews in your local paper. And with Rotten Tomatoes in one website, you have access to hundreds of film critics from all across the country, all across the world, with all kinds of different perspectives. I think that's a great thing, the ability to aggregate so many critics so that you can just go there and find maybe the one that you like. But I also think that it has done a bit of a disservice to the critical community in that for a lot of people, criticism now is just a number. It's the tomato, green or red, fresh or splat. They don't really engage with the criticism themselves and then they sort of wield that number like a weapon against people that like or don't like a certain movie. And that I think is completely antithetical to the world of criticism. I've said this on this channel and many other channels. I think that there are some things that Rotten Tomatoes could have done and could still do that would sort of clarify what the tomato meter number is. They haven't done that for a variety of reasons. So I think that a lot of people look at that and it's a bit of a flawed data set or it's a bit of a flawed number but at the same time if Rotten Tomatoes has led people or opened the doorway for people to say, oh, that person's interesting, uh, you know, because they're reading a bunch of reviews underneath the movie and it leads them to find that critic and to read their work and to follow them across different outlets, etc., then I think that that is a positive. So yeah, mixed blessing, I think, with Rotten Tomatoes. It could be improved. Those improvements haven't really been done on a larger scale, but hope springs eternal. Our next question comes from Wisconsin and concerns one of my favorite subject matters, Movie food. Hey, Dan, it is Lexus from the best of the Midwest, a.k.a. Wisconsin. Go Packers. Um, I know everybody loves popcorn, but do you have a specific movie-going snack? 
for me, it's Reese's Pieces. I feel like even if I try to avoid them, I'm always grabbing a bag of Reese's Pieces at the movie theaters. So do you have like a very specific movie snack outside of popcorn that you like to enjoy when you are watching films? Love your work and appreciate all the coverage that you do on your channel. Thank you. That's a great question, and I usually do get something to eat when I go to the movies unless I've just eaten a meal. I try not to go incredibly hungry. Usually it's something of a snack. A couple times a year I'll go having not had a meal recently, and I will get movie nachos, which, by the way, almost everywhere you go are terrible. They're not very good, but they're like a comforting level of terrible. I know how terrible they're going to be. And a couple times a year, I'm like, you know, I just want that specific kind of movie nacho bad that I know is consistent across all chains and pretty much everywhere, except for your fancy smancy places that probably make pretty good nachos. Nine times out of 10, it is popcorn. That's just the classical movie snack. I don't really eat it that much outside of the movies, but it just feels like a movie when I've got popcorn in my hand. Every once in a while though, I will go with Raisinets. If I'm gonna go with a movie candy, it's Raisinets. I don't do well with eating a whole lot of sugar all at once, so Raisinets kind of splits that sweetness scale for me, and I just like them. I know it's a boring candy, but I really, really enjoy it. So most of the time, popcorn. Rarely it'll be nachos, and from time to time, Raisinets. Our next question is from David in the great state of New York. Hey, Ben, this is David from New York. Currently, there's been a lot of talk of film critics that... Um, are trying to break into the industry as directors or writers, and um, a lot of them are basically stating that they will not negatively review a movie. They'd rather just celebrate a film. They don't want to bash it, as they say. And I was just wondering what your thought process is. Can a film critic also work in the industry? Uh, or is this such a conflict of interest, it's just not possible? Thanks for that question, David, and I appreciate the tactfulness, but just to kind of put our cards out on the table, it seemed fairly obvious here uh, that you were referring to Chris Stuckman, who I think has built something in the YouTube critical movie space that every critic, including myself, should be trying to emulate as far as the size of his audience, the loyalty of his audience, and I think the integrity of him as a critic. Recently, he has moved towards filmmaking, and again, full disclosure here, I know Chris, I've met him a number of times, he came and did a lot of work with Screen Junkies, we've always been on very friendly terms, we're not what I would describe as close, but we've communicated several times over the years. I'm excited for Shelby Oaks, I'm a backer of Shelby Oaks, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie, but this transition that he's done, and he's been very open about it, from critic to artist, and how it's affected his critical opinion, has brought up this question in a lot of different areas, which is, can an artist also be a film critic? And that's the sort of question that I call a Reverend Lovejoy question. Ooh, short answer yes with an if, long answer no with a but. And to be clear, lots of directors, especially going back into the 50s and 60s, started out their career as film critics. Lots of current directors write pieces of film criticism. Other critics have gone into screenwriting and other areas in the industry. So it's not like that line has never been crossed or never been blurred before. But I think that the question really is, could somebody who is actively making films who is building relationships within the film industry with filmmakers, be a film critic in the traditional sense, in the sense of somebody whose job it is to watch a movie, to hopefully dispassionately decide what they think of the film, and then to share that opinion, positive or negative, with an audience. I think that's what the idea of a modern film critic is for a lot of people. And in that capacity, I do think that it's hard for somebody who has close ties with people inside the film industry to be a critic in that sense. It is hard to sort of dispassionately look at a film when you're wondering what the possible ramifications of your review might be with the people who made the film. That's why when I think about Chris's film coming out, I don't think that I'm going to review it because it would be hard for me as a critic to dispassionately watch the movie because I do know Chris and I respect his work and I respect his channel and I want him to succeed. And so I'll always sort of be hovering outside of myself saying, okay, well, am I noticing something? Am I amping something up? Am I maybe uh, moving past something that I might have noted otherwise because you know I, I don't want to be hard on the movie? I think that every critic has to ask themselves those questions, but at a certain point, I think you have to just say, you know, I'm a little too close to the situation. And so 
I'm going to take a pass on this one. I think when you move into the role of making movies and being an artist, then you do, or maybe you should, largely give up the role of being a consumer critic, if you will. The, the person that says this movie's good or this movie's bad. But just because you're an artist, I don't think that means that you give up the right to talk about movies or to critique films that you love. Martin Scorsese, I think, is one of the best modern film critics and a great film historian. And he talks so much about the movies that he loves and why he loves them. And he breaks down the craft of it and why this shot works and this shot doesn't work. He elevates new filmmakers and movies that he likes. These are all things that a traditional film critic does. Martin Scorsese also does those things, but he's not what you would call, you know, your average critic. He's certainly not doing, you know, thumbs up and thumbs down in the weekly papers. I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about the movies that you love or movies that have influenced you as an artist, as long as people understand that that's what your perspective is, that that's where you're coming from. And from everything that I've seen, Chris has been very open and honest about that. The only place I think it gets a little bit iffy and where I might offer a bit of light criticism is if you come to it from an angle of, well, I'm in the industry and I know how it really works. And so this is why you're not correct about what you think or say about these different movies. Because yes, on a certain level, that's true. Somebody who is making movies is intimately involved in the mechanics of it. And they do know more than people that are outside of the industry, how certain parts of that industry work. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think that intimacy with a movie or with the process gives you any sort of greater level of objectivity. It's one reason why I was never really that concerned with going to the big movie premieres and the red carpets. I've been to a few of them and I can tell you that those are very electric atmospheres, but I also think that it's pretty useless as a critic to go to one of those screenings and try to get an objective feel for how this movie is playing or how people are reacting to it because an audience at a big red carpet premiere is the most invested audience in the success of that film that you're gonna find. That audience is full of people who are executives, who are financially staked in that movie doing well, of actors and their friends and their families who are gonna love it because that's a person that they love up there on that screen and they're excited for them. A lot of times it's with the most engaged fans who are just excited to be there and to see this movie. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, I've been to a few of these and they are an absolute blast. But I would never review a movie based on that experience because I don't think that that is the average movie going experience. And I think it does hurt your objectivity just because you're close to it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a greater perspective on it. I'm sort of in the Lester Bang school when it comes to film criticism. Uh, don't make friends and be honest and unmerciful. And I don't think, by the way, that that means mean or angry. When people hear the word critic, they think it means that you're automatically criticizing things angrily and you're looking for things that go wrong. But I consider it much more akin to critiquing a movie, which can be good or bad. And by the way, at least on my part, when I say that I do or don't like a movie, I'm not asking you to agree with me. Honestly, what I want is for you to engage with that criticism because that's what I think the role of a critic is. It's to get you to engage and think about a piece of art or a movie and to think about not just that you saw it, but why you liked it or why you didn't like it. And I think that the role of a critic in large part in saying why they did or didn't like a movie is to get the audience or the person reading or watching that review to say, oh yeah, I agree with that. I, you know, I didn't think about that or that guy's so wrong because that's not what the story said at all or, or that's not what I took that shot to mean at all. That means that you're now engaging with that art and it becomes a discourse and a discussion. And I think that's what the role of criticism is. And that's really what the role of art is. It's to engage discussion and creativity and if there's no discussion, then the creativity dies. So to sum up, yes, I think that an artist can be a critic in the sense that they can share what they love about different movies and what moves them, what makes them passionate, what inspires them as a filmmaker. But I don't think that they can really fill that role as a traditional critic, as the person who's going to watch every movie or just about every movie and be able to dispassionately say whether they liked it or not, because I think that those close ties can sometimes endanger that objectivity. Well, that was an epic answer and I need a little bit of a break. So before we move on, I want to thank for the last time, the sponsor of the Mint Mobile hotline. The reason that we're asking these questions here today, Mint Mobile. Hollywood just got a big infusion of cash with Dune's big opening, but why should those big wigs have all the fun? It's time to put more cash in your pocket with Mint Mobile, where you can get a mobile plan for just 15 bucks a month right now when you sign up for a three-month plan. That's right, you can get any three-month Mint Mobile plan 
for just 15 bucks a month. Think about how much money you could be saving every month at Mint Mobile. You could get those premium Dune IMAX seats with the X-rated popcorn bucket and a little money left over. Plus at Mint Mobile, all plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. At Mint, you can choose from three, six, or 12-month plans, and they give you the best rate for you and your family. And at Mint, families start at just two lines. Plus, you can use your own number and your existing phone. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Merle. That's mintmobile.com slash Merle. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Merle. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions Restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, let's wrap up our last few questions. And our next one comes from Sabrina, who's a very eagle-eyed viewer. Hi, Dan. My name's Sabrina. I've been following you on Screen Junkies since, I think, 2015 or something. And I was really happy when you started your own channel. I also follow you on Letterboxd, and I've noticed that you have been logging a lot of Steven Spielberg's movies in sequential order. So I'm wondering, is that for a special project or something or an upcoming video? And if so, is this a new series that you want to do? What other filmmakers do you want to watch all of their filmography? Personally, I'm trying to watch every Kubrick and Scorsese this year, so we'll see if that happens. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for that question, Sabrina. And yes, good catch. I was logging on Letterboxd, Steven Spielberg's almost entire filmography in chronological order several months ago. And it was a case of my ambition getting the better of me. I was planning programming for what was going to be here on the channel while I was on my honeymoon, while Mara and I were away in New Zealand. And I had this great plan to take a whole week and it would be Steven Spielberg week. And it would be like a, a four part video series on like, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday of his entire filmography, where I would break down each one of his films chronologically, the art of it and his advancement as a filmmaker. And then the last video would be my own personal ranking of all of his movies. Steven Spielberg's my favorite director of all time. And so this seemed like a natural fit to take up that week while we were away in New Zealand, but I just couldn't actually get it done. It was way too big of a project for the time that I had to do it. The good news is that I got a lot of the background work done, the viewing, as well as writing up a lot of the blurbs and my thoughts. So I would say that I made significant progress when it comes to the project itself. So who knows, maybe I'll actually be able to pull it together. As far as a director whose entire filmography I'd like to watch, I've done Scorsese uh, just about, I think I have two or three Scorsese films left. The big one for me at some point is Alfred Hitchcock. And if I do watch the whole filmography, I'd like to do it chronologically because I think it's so interesting to see the growth of an artist over time. I did it a few different times for the Schmodown, and that's actually one of the reasons when you mentioned Letterboxd, for a very long time, I had to hide some of the stuff that I was watching. I had to keep a note of it on my phone uh, and then log it all after I'd done a particular match because I found out that some of my opponents in the Schmodown were literally sending spies to my letterbox to report back on what I was watching so they would know what movies I was studying for different matches. So I'm glad that I don't have to keep an off the books record of letterbox anymore. But yeah, that Steven Spielberg thing is something I was super passionate about. I got a lot of the work done and who knows, maybe you'll see it here on the channel one day. Our next question is an editing question and it comes from Vince in Texas. Hey Dan, this is Vince from Portland, Texas. I've been noticing a trend in movie trailers where music, especially intense beats or syncopated rhythms, is often synchronized with action sequences, typically guns or punches. While it's creative, I sometimes feel it's overused or can detract from the narrative of the trailer. What are your thoughts on this trend, and do you think it enhances or detracts, and has it become too cliche? I'm excited to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks. Thanks, Vince. And I've noticed that too, especially in action trailers. If you don't know what Vince is talking about, here are a couple of clips. I think my thoughts probably mirror yours in a lot of ways, which is that I thought that it was a really cool thing the first time that I saw it. 
but it's been done so many times at this point that it's losing a lot of that impact. Because when you see it on a trailer like Baby Driver, which was a long time ago at this point, then the movie looks so cool. And I thought that the movie lived up to the trailer. At this point though, that editing trick has been in so many trailers for so many bad movies that I just don't even pay attention to it anymore. And the reason these things happen are a couple of reasons. First of all, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. A lot of times you'll see a producer or an executive that will see a trailer for a movie and say, oh, I like that thing with the punches and the guns. Do that in our trailer. And the other thing is that there are trailer houses and some editors that only do trailers in Hollywood. And so it's possible that they even might go to the same editor of a trailer and say, hey, you know that thing you did for Bullet Train or Pacific Rim or whatever? I want you to do it for our movie. So it's literally the same editor doing the same thing because you're replicating that style. It's cyclical. These things happen. Remember when everything had the inception horn in it? That's just what happens. People see something that works, they imitate it, and eventually it goes away. Our final question on the Mint Mobile Hotline comes from Nikki in Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, Dan. This is Nikki from Boston, Massachusetts. I've been a big fan of the Disney parks, uh, but I've really seen the downturn in the quality in the past five years and maybe unsubstantiated uh, have believed that the Disney company is on a downturn and possible collapse. Do you have any big nebulous neb Bulis opinions on um, how these big companies with their diminishing box office numbers, uh, how that might affect these companies long term, um, especially Disney. Thanks for all you do, Dan. Been a big fan over five years now. Uh, I'm a huge analytics person, so charts has been a weekly staple for me. Uh, have a good one. Thanks for that question, Nikki. And Disney is obviously a company that gets a lot of the focus. But if you watch this channel, you'll know that I think that nearly every major media company made the same mistake, which is to invest billions in the streaming revolution without having a real plan as to how they were actually going to achieve that creatively or sometimes even practically. And I think it all goes back to the same root cause, which is that all of these studios are multinational worldwide conglomerates or they're owned by multinational worldwide conglomerates, which means that they're often thinking about their stock price first and foremost. What's the stock gonna do? What's What's the dividend going to be? What are our investors going to say? What's the Q3 report? What does Wall Street think about that? And there's not as much thinking about one, the creative output or two, the actual consumer experience. You mentioned the Disney parks. Mara and I went a couple of years ago and I was blown away by the changes that had been made. The Genie Plus and Lightning Lane and you have to get up at a certain time of day and reserve your thing and it's an extra fee for this and it's an extra fee for that. And if you want to do this quick, then you have to get this thing and the money just keeps piling up and piling up. And I'm sure that these are services that made Disney a lot of money but have they really gone back and looked at the consumer experience? Because it could be incredibly short-sighted. Okay, sure, you're making money right now, but how many people are you turning off of going to your parks? How many people wanna go but can't afford it anymore because of how much it costs? Or how many people used to go to the park, people that go to Disneyland or Disney World all the time, that now don't go as much because of all of the hoops that you have to jump through and all of the expense? It's so short-sighted, but that's what these companies do. They're only looking at the current quarter or the current current fiscal year and they lose sight of the big picture. That ultimately I think is what the whole streaming war legacy will be. Every major media company just about in Hollywood losing complete sight of the big picture to chase those short-term gains. As far as the long-term effects and the diminishing box office, I think we're just now getting into what those effects are going to be. Now, the pandemic obviously had a lot to do with it, but so many of the studios essentially dismantled the theatrical model to drive people to streaming. And now that streaming is not providing as much money as they thought, they're trying to rebuild that model. Can they do it? Will they be able to come up with a hybrid way to make money? Some studios are doing it. Some studios aren't doing it. But I think that that's really what we're going to find out in the next two to five years is what does the entertainment industry look like and how many people can survive whatever this new look is. And that is our last question on the Mint Mobile hotline. And as I mentioned, that is also a wrap on my partnership with Mint. I'd like to thank them for being a sponsor here on the channel for the last couple of months. I wish we had more time together, but that's just the way that things work out sometimes. However, just because the Mint Mobile hotline is going away, that doesn't mean that you're not still gonna be able to call in and ask questions because I own that number. 
I set the whole thing up and I still have access to it. It's just not sponsored by Mint Mobile. It's actually not sponsored by anybody right now. So for the short term or maybe for the long term, I'm just gonna have this hotline sponsored by things that I like. And so for this first new edition, I'd like to invite you to call in with your questions to the Tony Collette and Hereditary hotline at plus one three two three eight six three thirty three eleven. That's right, the hotline is brought to you by what I think is one of the greatest performances in modern cinema history and one of the most undervalued and underawarded. Will there be a new actual paying sponsor for this hotline? I don't really know, but it's going to be brought to you by things that I love. So that number once again, plus one, three, two, three, eight, six, three, thirty, three, eleven. I look forward to taking your questions from the Tony Collette and Hereditary hotline. And I want to thank you to everybody who sent in a question to the Mint Mobile hotline, whether you were able to get your question on the air or not. Maybe the Tony Collette hotline will be a little kinder to you. Thanks so much to everybody who's been watching and engaging with the channel. Don't forget, I will have my recap of the Academy Awards up in the early hours tomorrow morning. And the Academy Awards are tonight as this video is being uploaded. Thanks so much for watching and spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye. Because nobody admits anything they've done!